Another sideways week for the monetary precious metals. The spot price of gold appears to be closing just above 1,300 fiat Federal Reserve notes per troy ounce, while the silver spot price appears to be ending the week relatively flat. Priced around $15.35 per troy ounce mark, that's in fiat US dollar terms of course. This week we will be doing a bit of coverage on last summer's Supreme Court ruling here in the United States, which now has reached the online bullion dealer marketplace. We have a mix of bad news, good news to cover. As well, we will also interview the executive director from our industry's largest watchdog group to better understand state sales tax implications ongoing. But before we begin, another excellent low price, limited time offering from our show's sponsor. For a limited time, the Austrian Mint and SD Bullion are offering you a Silver Philharmonic Buy 19 Get One Free Coin deal. Officially issued by this storied 825 year old European Bullion Mint. These famous European Silver Bullion products come packaged complete in protective sealed Austrian Mint tubes containing 20 coins apiece or in bulk sealed Austrian mint cases containing 500 troy ounces in each. These guaranteed one troy ounce Austrian Philharmonics are official European legal tender silver coins. Each is comprised with a minimum 0.999 fine silver bullion content. Austrian Philharmonic bullion coins qualify for silver IRAs, making them an excellent choice for tax deferred, long term bullion savings. Discreetly shipped, fully insured to SD Bullion customers' doors and non-bank faults. Don't delay. This free silver Austrian Philharmonic Bullion coin deal will end soon. Welcome back to this week's Metals and Markets podcast. I'm your host, James Anderson of SD Bullion. Before we bring on this week's guest, I want to give you all a bit of background on the state bullion sales tax matter at hand. Policy within this industry used to be you only had to collect state sales taxes within the states you had nexus in. Nexus basically means uh, you have some sort of physical office or employee presence in a state. Now, my having worked in California for many years when I began in this industry, we used to have to collect state sales taxes on deliveries within California for all bullion orders of less than $1,500 U.S. dollars. Adding to this website programming complexity was also charging applicable, often unique, local California county taxes on top of the flat 7.5 California state sales tax at the time. This required our being on top of all 58 California county local tax laws, and if they changed, we had to change our website accordingly. Needless to say, our website programmer and tax law service providers had their work cut out for them. At the time, the general industry practice for bullion sales outside of your state was simply that it was incumbent on the buyers of bullion in their respective states and counties to know and comply with their local state and county tax laws and to rectify whatever state and county taxes they may have perhaps owed via online bullion purchases year in, year out. Well, that's changing. Moving ahead to more recent times, in the middle of last summer 2018, the US the US Supreme Court, in an attempt to perhaps better level the playing field between the Amazons of the world and the local brick and mortar stores, ruled in essence that all online sellers or exchangers of virtually any goods or services across state lines are now responsible for collecting and paying local state taxes of the goods or services rendered to the customers outside their states. The onerous is now on businesses to know all fluctuating state and county tax laws. And yes, we know firsthand it's a ton of work and a monumental task to comply with. Well, for the bullion industry, there's a bit of good news and bad news with this trend change of online bullion state and county sales taxing. Good news is, today, more than half of the states in the Republic of the United States have full exemptions on bullion sales taxes. States like Ohio, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and many others, they have full state tax exemptions for bullion sales to respective state residents. The bad news remains there are a handful of other states who have varying degrees of taxation, on bullion or collector coin numismatics. For instance, states like Kentucky, New Jersey, Mississippi, Wisconsin. They and many others have variations of state taxes on bullion, numismatics, even coin accessories. In the show notes, I will leave you some links so you can learn more about your respective state's tax situation regarding bullion and other items. The bottom line is this. 
In 2019, if you're a retail bullion dealer or a conduit for any online bullion sales of any sort, you'd better be collecting applicable state and county sales taxes now, or perhaps just save a war chest of fiat currency, risking the moment that some state representative comes knocking at your door asking for their cut of their state's sales. Of course, this adds not just complexity, but costs for anyone seeking to comply and not break the seemingly exponential growing laws of this land. Moving onwards to our guest this week. The man's name is Mr. Jimmy Hayes. He recently became the Executive Director of the Industry Council for Tangible Assets. Often known by its abbreviation, ITGA, the Industry Council for Tangible Assets is a 501c6 nonprofit association dedicated to the rare coin, paper money, and precious metal industry now for over 30 years. ITGA exists to promote and safeguard the interests of its members serving as the industry watchdog to maintain an appropriate and favorable legislative regulatory climate in the USA in all 50 states. The association provides a medium through which its members may confer, consult, cooperate with, and educate government and its agencies to achieve solutions to problems affecting their businesses. The following discussion is between myself and Mr. Jimmy Hayes, the current executive director of ITCA, as you will be able to tell quite quickly, Mr. Hayes is a, an experienced and sharp, long-time practicing financial lawyer, a former 10-year U.S. congressman, and is co-author of the current Louisiana Banking Code. Jimmy was gracious in taking time to give us his thoughts on this state tax law matter. And so here's our discussion from yesterday. Welcome to this week's Metals and Markets Podcast. I'm your host, James Anderson of SD Bullion. With us this week is the Executive Director of the ICTA. He is Mr. Jimmy Hayes. Mr. Hayes, thank you for coming uh, on our show this week, taking the time to speak with myself and our listeners. I'm delighted to be with you. Jimmy, can you explain your role at the Industry Council for Tangible Assets and, and perhaps a little bit as to why you joined the organization recently? Well, my background before entering Congress was as the Commissioner of Financial Institutions for the state of Louisiana and Commissioner of Securities. In addition to that, uh, as a lawyer with a major New Orleans law firm, I had been involved in many of the legal questions, which now have become so important as a result of the, the recent Wayfair decision. When you add to that my proximity in Washington, in fact, my personal friendship with uh, Justice Kennedy, who uh, authored that opinion, and then finally to climax that, uh, my background was that I had one of the most famous coin collections ever sold. So I don't know where ICTA got the idea that they ought to talk to somebody to know about banking, coin securities, and had a congressional background and new Supreme Court justices. Somehow or another, they found me. And that's, that's, how I, that's how I took this on, because it was important to me as a collector, as a lifelong collector, and someone who knew all these dealers, uh, to both put together the dealer membership and to initiate a collector membership to understand what legislatures were going to do with the opportunity the Supreme Court had given them and that they would go much, much more broadly beyond what the court's decision held. And in anticipation with that, I had been working with staff at Judiciary Committee, but unfortunately, uh, all hell broke loose at the state levels before we were able, able to gather the support for a, a federal response. So what are the implications of this Supreme Court's decision last summer, of course? Um, I mean, for the bullion industry, the collectible coin dealers, what, what, what's going on right now, just in, as you see it from your point, your vantage point? Well, it's first important to understand that uh, even though even Bloomberg refers to this as an Internet tax, <laughs> the Supreme Court was talking about interstate sales tax of anything and everything. Uh, you're most interested, obviously, and I'm most interested in ICTA with, with uh, coins, with bullion, with those related products. But this is anything that crosses state lines in any manner. That would include things that, that perhaps your listeners would, would not anticipate, telecommunications. The Telecommunication Act was exempted in the old Senate bill that was passed as the Marketplace Fairness Act, in which we held off in the House because it was such bad legislation. But at least the Senate understood that there would be things that state might reach into that the federal view was that it should not be touched at state level in state taxation. I assure you there are hundreds of things in that category. Instead of, however, digressing, 
let's let's stay with uh, bullion, for example. You have a commodities exchange. Wouldn't it be ridiculous to believe that someone can buy bullion in one fashion and in the exact same fashion cannot do that from a dealer? Yeah, right. So I could buy a COMEX tra- uh, contract, for instance, in gold or silver uh, in whatever state I'm in, and there'll be no tax, of course. But if I bought bullion in, say, a state like uh, New York State, uh, there would obviously be tax ramifications. Exactly. In addition to which, can you imagine the idea that if you bought a share of stock, it would be taxed? Well, guess what? You have many of the coins that are put in IRAs for deferral of tax. That's the same thing as taking one subject of an IRA, taxing it, and another subject of an IRA and say, well, of course, we wouldn't tax that. That belongs to an IRA. Right. So it's obviously very complex implications. And, and on our end, we've done... A, a, a very large amount of work just trying to figure this out. You know, we have had to hire consultants, et cetera. And, you know, we're pretty big bullion dealerships, so we can afford to do this. Uh, I'm thinking about the people who say have a local mom and pop brick and mortar coin shop in say a city like Albuquerque or something like that. And maybe they have an eBay store, let's say, and they sell some of the collectibles that come to and fro there um, in their store on say their eBay store. Now, all of a sudden, um, they're liable if they're selling it to states that do have tax ramifications. Lord knows what could happen. Maybe someone from those states could show up at their brick and mortar and say, you owe X. And if they never got the, that money or those taxes, say, from the people they were selling it to, they still owe that state if, they, if that state came to their door, supposedly. Well, let me give you a, a list of equally, if not worse, possibilities. Suppose that who shows up at the door says, we've come to audit you because you made a sale in our state. Anyone who's ever gone through a state audit, we're not talking about whether you passed or failed or had a problem with the audit. It's very expensive to do, and it takes a lot of time to have compliance. How would you like to have 50 of them? Those are the kind of unintended consequences that are out there, in addition to which you have states that don't recognize a resale certificate. So you have people who are selling to people they've sold to for years who are dealers who resell, that they know they're doing that as a wholesale sale. The state may not recognize that. And therefore, tell them they're obligated to pay sales tax because they're not going to recognize the resale certificate. These are all things that are are quite frightening. And look, there's so many small businesses that are uh, asking me, we want to comply, but we're not even sure how we can do that. And secondly, we're not sure that we can afford to collect the data and and to pay someone to, to do the kind of work that we don't have employees to do uh, in order to be able to comply. Uh, I spoke to one dealer who's got software that is tracking 50 states right now, but the cost of that's over $70,000 a year. Yeah. Yeah. It's no joke. It's it basically in my, from where I can sit, where I'm sitting, it, it basically puts even more pressure on the smaller, smaller dealers, right? I mean, the large mm, high volume bullion dealer like ourselves, we can take that cost on. But if you're talking about someone who's smaller, who, who only sells, say, a million or two worth of bullion per year out of their brick and mortar, that's a big that's a big difference. And, and that's a lot more uh, cost as far as having an employee try to keep up with this kind of stuff. Yes. And, and to get back to the Wayfair decision, this is one of the things the state legislators do not know about or ignore even if they do know about it. The Wayfair decision did not say that the South Dakota statute was valid. It sent it back to the state court, back to the lower court, I should say, for a determination as to whether it would have interference with small business. The Wayfair decision does not say, if you're not in the state, we can tax you. What it says is, if you have no physical presence, that is not a mandate in order to be taxed. Everything else is unsaid in Wayfair. And I assure you, that you have barriers and burdens on small business that violate the interstate commerce clause, and those issues were not decided by Wayfair. But what you have in the state house is we need money, and this says we're going to make a lot of money, and if it doesn't make a lot of money, that's okay. We're going to spend it anyway, and that'll just be a deficit. They could care less about the constitutional implications, and they know this. How many of those businesses can afford to litigate with them? That's a huge edge that is completely unfair, but it's a leverage they're taking advantage of. Now, we had a pre-interview discussion yesterday about some of the states you had mentioned. I was hoping you might uh, go through them. I think there's some positive news here. I mean, 
you know, as far as there's roughly 35 states that are just flat out exempt for at least on the bullion and collector coin side. Um, there's about 15 or so, and we have them on our website and we'll try and keep on top of it. But obviously there's a lot, uh, always moving and changing. Like I'm trying to bring up right now. I think West Virginia, there's some positive news coming on. West Virginia has passed a statute. The governor's not yet signed, but the governor's not indicated he would oppose it. So, uh, I believe that will be signed, but until it is signed, it counts as a very positive thing, passage in both houses on the governor's desk. And those in West Virginia that, that are in contact with me say that they anticipate that it will be signed. In Tennessee, you had a, uh, a committee hearing that went uh, favorably. That has not yet been set for the floor. It has not yet met the procedural requirements. But it's extremely important to show that uh, even during a time when, when those states like Tennessee are looking at fiscal issues, that uh, this exemption uh, will appear to go to go forward. Its future is not determined, but its future is, is rather bright. And I think a similar circumstance exists uh, in Arkansas, where you have uh, movement and you have um, overcome opposition in the initial stages, but it's it's far from from reaching conclusion. But the fact that they're going forward, those, that's all good news. The bad news is that you have a couple of states where you have people who are seeking to remove the exemptions. Uh, one of those is the state of Washington. And that's very unfortunate because the uh, state of Washington has for many years uh, prior to now realized that they had built an industry because of this exemption. And unfortunately, as time goes by, people forget why they did something. Well, the reason that you have over 35 states is because of the, the very small spread on buy and sell on bullion-related products. You can't add a sales tax and continue to do business. Uh, hopefully, that, that case will be made more clearly to those in Washington state who are considering uh, removing that exemption. Now, what uh, being the executive director, obviously, you're charged with uh, you know a pretty heavy burden here. I, what is... It goes overall strategy right now to fight back on this issue. What are you guys doing in, in just general terms, I suppose? Well, maybe you ought to, you ought to think of the uh, Wayfair decision as Pearl Harbor. Uh, <laughs> although, although it was anticipated, quite frankly, for seven years, uh, working with the, the staff of the um, House Judiciary Committee, we have worked toward trying to get uh, legislation done in anticipation of what the court might do if the case reached it. The reason we could not get a majority, this was not a Democrat versus Republican. <laughs> the reason we couldn't get a majority is you had every governor, Republican and Democrat, saying, oh, no, don't do anything, but we need this. We think we can win this. You had all these associations of state legislators, Democrats and Republicans, asking their members of Congress, no, no, leave this alone, leave this alone. But what happened is the determination by the Supreme Court is much worse than legislation because of the voids. And the voids are just inviting an overreach by the states who are in search of any way to try to, um, to, to add revenue. So now what will happen is you'll start to have state legislators realize something they never understood before. Your state is not made up just of buyers. It's made up of sellers. And you're impacting their ability to sell not only in their own state but in others. And you're going to see a tremendous unexpected consequence when you have other states harming the people who live in your state and you are harming the people who live in other states. It is the reason that the Commerce Clause is first. The Commerce Clause recognized that if you built barriers around the states, it would be a threat to the union itself. Well, this is an economic threat and a tremendous one. It is if you have a whole bunch of tariff systems about to be placed, in this instance, unknowingly and without the realization of the unintended consequences. Jimmy, how can listeners support ITGA and, and perhaps you know support uh, the, the effort to try and reduce some of these uh, interstate uh, sales tax burdens that uh, people are, are currently uh, concerned of uh, about? Well, the many things we're doing, one of them is we're updating every day uh, state laws and uh, the anticipation of, of things that might change, making people aware of what's out there. We're making people aware of actually what their potential consequences are. Uh, we're helping uh, to identify some folks who are working hard on inexpensive software 
All of these things involve uh, dealers in many cases. But let me jump to collector because I'm not a dealer. I was never a dealer. I'm a collector. Let me make you a promise. You will see both numismatic coins and bullion premium pieces. By that, you know what I'm talking about. Higher higher than just the, the simple difference between the go uh, because of higher grades and things like that. You'll see a drop of 8 to 10% in value. Because it will already, just like the stock market does, anticipate the imposition of tax. So if you're out there with a collection, and that collection's worth ten thousand dollars, I believe your collection's worth about ninety one hundred right now, and that is a fact. And what I would urge them to do is, I believe that they should make their members of Congress aware of what is happening to small business, how it's affecting. Dealers and small business and the employees that have to be laid off whenever you have additional tax burdens. But more than that, you've just taken away value from collectors built up over time, value sometimes inside of, of an IRA with qualifying assets. And that that's an unintended consequence that is being imposed at the same time that you're imposing burdens on small business that will cause many of them to be, unfortunately, uh, cutting employees and cutting uh, the size of their operations, or in some instances, closing them. The state of Louisiana uh, did a repeal of the exemption. A little over a year later, we would get them, and we got them to reinstate the exemption. Unfortunately, the reason we got them to reinstate it was they saw what happened. You had businesses have to let people go. You had businesses no longer selling related items that were taxable because they weren't selling bullion. And you had a couple of businesses relocate. Yeah. Well, Jimmy, we really do appreciate you coming on and explaining this in further detail. Uh, there was no chance I was going to be able to go into it as far as you are. You're obviously uh, <laughs> deep in the weeds here. And uh, we do appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Well, have, have, please have all of your listeners take a look at the NCTA website. And uh, we're a rather inexpensive group to join, but I think we're real worth it. I think we do. Uh, a lot. And I'll tell you what, we're going to do way more than that. Uh, the question isn't whether we're going to win this. It's when. If we can get enough people to understand soon enough, uh, we can we can be in front of the hurricane. If we have to come after the hurricane, it's going to be a big mess. But this is going to happen. There will be a federal response simply because of the unintended consequences, of which are a minute part. But the unintended consequences of this kind of unleashing of tax authority will affect every segment of commerce. Well, Jimmy Hayes, thank you so much again for coming on the podcast. I enjoyed it very much. 